Ms. McCabe, we appreciate you being with us this morning. And uh, for the other people in the audience, as you know, the President's been meeting with the Democrat Caucus this morning. And uh, so we were delayed in the beginning of this hearing, but as soon as uh, one or two of our friends on this side of the aisle arrive, we'll get started. And uh, uh, because we expect some votes on the House floor around 12, uh, 15 or 12.30. And I know the members have a lot of uh, questions for you, Ms. McCabe, which you are, I'm sure you're excited to get those questions. And, and we look forward to having that discussion with you.
I'd like to bring the uh, hearing to order. Uh, this morning's hearing is going to be focused on EPA's proposed ozone rule. The proposed, uh, I'd like to recognize myself for five minutes for an opening statement. The proposed rule would lower the standard from the current 75 parts per billion down to 65 or 70, but the agency is also taking comments on 60 parts per billion. These proposed levels are so low that in some parts of the country they are at or near background levels. The proposed levels are so low that even EPA admits that it is not fully known in some areas how to achieve full compliance. In other words, in other words, they would have to use unknown controls to do it, to meet those standards. The marginal cost of ratcheting down the existing standard go through the roof, and EPA estimates that a 65 to 70 parts per billion standard would cost 3.9 to 15 billion annually, and that a 60 parts would cost 39 billion annually. Independent estimates are much higher, including a National Association of Manufacturers study that puts the cost of a 65 parts per billion standard at 140 billion a year, which would make the, th this the agency's most expensive regulation ever. This study also estimates 1.4 million fewer jobs in household cost, averaging $830 per year. These costs come on top of all of the other rules we've seen from this administration, many of which also impact the energy and manufacturing sectors. Moreover, this rule is yet another chapter in the administration's effort to force more extreme climate policies on the American uh, people. I might also, I, I'd like to just name a few of them. We've done the Utility Mac, the Boiler Mac, the Cement Mac, the cross-state air pollution rule, the PM, the 111D, the 111B, the Tier 3, all on top of this uh, proposed ozone uh, rule. I would also like to point out that in today in America there are 230 counties not in compliance with the 2008 standard. And I might also add that e EPA is just now getting around to providing implementing guidance for the states for the 2008 rule. Now these, count, they, these counties not meeting the new standard would be designated as non-attainment. As I said, there are 230 counties today in non-attainment around the country. EPA estimates that fully 358 counties that currently have monitors would be in non-attainment if they go to 70 parts per billion and 558 counties would be in noncompliance at 65 parts per billion based on recent data. Now this does not include counties nearby or without ozone monitors that may also be designated by EPA to be in nonattainment. Now a nonattainment designation is like a self-imposed recession for some areas. In such counties, it becomes extremely difficult to obtain a new permit to build a factory, to expand a factory or a power plant, and even permits for existing facilities would be impacted. Just last week, in a survey of manufacturers, over half of them, in fact 53 percent, said they were not likely to continue with a new plant or expansion if it is located in a non-attainment area. The same permitting challenges apply for roads and other large infrastructure projects. In effect, almost all new major job creating economic activity is jeopardized until the non-attainment area meets the standard, which could take years if not decades. Even the mere possibility that a location could later be designated to be in non-attainment is enough to scare off prospective employers so the proposed rule may already be doing damage. Now there must be, there's something wrong with our system when you have Los Angeles, San Joaquin Valley, m major parts of California that have the most stringent environmental standards in the country, and on top of that EPA 
and those areas, San Joaquin Valley, Los Angeles, may never be in compliance. And they're certainly not in compliance today and have been out of compliance since the beginning of the Clean Air Act. So we have a system that's not working very well. At this time, I'd like to recognize the gentleman from uh, uh, New Jersey, Mr. Pallone, for his five-minute opening statement. Thank you, uh, Chairman Whitfield, for holding this hearing on EPA's proposed ozone standard. I also want to welcome EPA Acting Assistant Administrator Janet McCabe and thank her for testifying before the subcommittee again. Since 1970, the cornerstone of the Clean Air Act has been a set of health-based air quality standards which help to ensure that all Americans can breathe healthy air. EPA must set each air quality standard based on science and medical evidence alone. Essentially, the standard sets the level of pollution that is safe to breathe. This structure has been extraordinarily effective in cleaning the air and protecting public health, including the health of children and seniors. But the current 75 parts per billion ozone standard has fallen short. Since 2008, the ozone standard has been weaker than the facts would allow. As such, the Independent Clean Air Scientific Advisory Committee made crystal clear that in order to adequately protect public health, EPA must strengthen the ozone standard to ensure an adequate margin of safety for all individuals. But these recommendations, unfortunately, were ignored by the Bush administration. To, to correct this flagrant disregard for the facts, EPA has now proposed, based on yet another exhaustive review of the scientific evidence, to revise the standard to fall within the range of 65 to 70 parts per billion as recommended by the Scientific Advisory Committee. EPA's decision is fully consistent with the law and the scientific evidence, and there are a litany of adverse health impacts that will be avoided with the stronger standard. Nearly a million asthma attacks in children, millions of missed school days, and thousands of premature deaths. These are meaningful real-world real world benefits, but I have little doubt that today we will hear much about costs. Uh, yet a unanimous United States Supreme Court opinion written by Justice Scalia, no less, made it clear that EPA's approach for determining a safe level of air pollution is correct and costs may not be considered. And that is why Congress designed the Clean Air Act. The standard is set based on the health science and economic costs are only considered later when determining the best way to implement the standard. In other words, EPA sets the goal for clean air and the states develop the lowest cost way to meet it. Although EPA may not consider costs in setting the standard, EPA has nevertheless worked with the Office of Management and Budget to prepare a careful analysis of the projected costs and benefits associated with reducing ozone. EPA estimates that the benefits associated with the new ozone standards would range from 13 to $38 billion annually, outweighing the cost by approximately three to one. Industry has prepared dubious and grossly inflated estimates of the projected costs, but they fail to consider any of the benefits. That paints a completely one-sided picture of the cost of cleaning our air, one that ignores the real costs that are borne by those who breathe, especially children whose lungs are developing and who breathe greater volumes of air for their size. We will also hear that EPA's proposed ozone standard will have dire consequences for economic growth. And these doomsday claims about the cost of clean air are nothing new. The history of the Clean Air Act is a history of exaggerated claims by industry that have never come true. The reality is that over the past 40 years, the Clean Air Act has produced tremendous public health benefits while supporting America's economic growth. EPA's ozone standard is long overdue. We need to let EPA do its job to reach the goal of the Clean Air Act, clean air for all Americans, and I look forward to Ms. McCabe's testimony. I yield back uh, the balance of my time. Jim yields back. This time I recognize the gentleman from Texas, uh, Mr. Olson, for five minutes. I thank the chair, and I'll be very brief. I spent long hours going over comments that EPA received about this new ozone rule. And there was a common theme. Will I lose my job? Questions came from big cities. Members of the Atlanta Chamber or the Greater Houston Partnership. They came from family farms and ranches. Members of the Iowa Farm Bureau or the Nebraska Home Builders. A mom-and-pop store in Pennsylvania wrote EPA 
and this is a quote, parents tell our children, eat your peas, then you can have dessert. EPA says, eat your peas, then you can have more peas, end quote. The worst came from EPA's workhorses, the state agencies who make this rule work. They have no clue about the science used for the health impacts. They worry if they can build new roads. These voices come from all of America. And I hope EPA starts listening. And if one of my colleagues on my side wants some time, I'll yield. If not, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. At this time, I recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Rush, for five minutes. I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, for this uh, hearing today on the EPA's proposed ozone rule. And I also want to welcome back uh, Ms. McCabe, the Acting Assistant Administrator for Air and Radiation at EPA. She's always given us her best and uh, always a pleasure to hear her insightful and forthright testimony before this subcommittee. Mr. Chairman, uh, today, it's been duly noted, we are here to discuss the proposed national ambient air quality standards for ozone, which the EPA is legally mandated to put forth uh, by the Clean Air Act. The Clean Air Act requires the EPA to set primary national ambient air quality standards at uh, concentration levels sufficient to protect the public health with an adequate margin of safety for certain pollutants that endanger public health and the environment. We know that the EPA establishes uh, these standards based on medical and scientific evidence as well as the recommendations provided by the Clean Air Scientific Advisory Committee, which, Mr. Chairman, you know is an independent scientific review committee. The EPA is required to base these standards, which must be reviewed every five years, solely on consideration of public health, and they must accurately reflect the latest scientific knowledge, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> we know that in 2008, the Bush administration failed to heed the unanimous recommendations of the committee, of the, of the Clean Air Scientific Advisory Committee, uh, of lowering this ozone uh, air quality standards to between 60 to 70 points per million. Instead, the EPA under President Bush set the standard at 75 ppm, despite the advice of the Scientific Advisory Committee that a 60 to 70, 60 to 70 ppm standard would be more protective of public health. The Obama administration also initially failed to re reconsider the ozone standard <clears throat> in 2009 until being ordered to do so by the courts in April of last year due to a lawsuit brought, brought forth by environmental and public health groups. So <clears throat> that leads us to ask the question, Mr. Chairman, why is this rule so very important and why did the courts, the court rather, force the EPA to act? Well, we know that there are serious health effects caused by the ozone, and the EPA's proposal will improve air quality and result in significant 
public health benefits. Children, the elderly, and people with respiratory diseases such as asthma will be impacted directly by this rule. The EPA estimates that there are currently 25.9 million people in the U.S. with asthma, including 7.1 million children. And Mr. Chairman, my city of Chicago has been and is disproportionately impacted uh, by uh, asthma and the effect that the ozone has on asthma. The most recent study shows that Cook County, Illinois, is home to over 113,000 children and over 340,000 adults with asthma. And Mr. Chairman, I don't know that a, what value can be placed on preventing all of these dire circumstances, all of these illnesses, all of these premature deaths and emergency room visits, but I know that the people who sent me here to represent them are some of the ones who will be impacted by uh, this uh, procedure and by this uh, action most of all. So I look forward to engaging Ms. McCabe on the rationale behind this proposal. And Mr. Chairman, I think I'm out of time, so I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. At this time, uh, Ms. McCabe, I want to thank you for coming here early this morning at 9.30. Once again, we apologize for the delay, but we're deli delighted that Janet McCabe is with us, the Acting Assistant Administrator at EPA, and you're recognized for five minutes for your uh, statement on the ozone rule. Thank you, Chairman Whitfield, Ranking Member Rush, members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today on EPA's proposed updates to the Ozone National Ambient Air Quality Standards. I'll try to be brief so we can get to your questions. The Clean Air Act requires EPA to review the National Ambient Air Quality Standards every five years to make sure that they continue to protect public health with an adequate margin of safety. For at-risk groups, including, as Ranking Member Rush has noted, the estimated 25.9 million people who have asthma in the United States, of whom 7.1 million are children, this is critical work. For this review, EPA examined the thousands of scientific studies, including more than 1,000 new studies published since EPA last revised the standards in 2008. And based on the law, a thorough review of all of that science, the recommendation of the agency's independent scientific advisors, and the assessment of EPA scientists and technical experts, the administrator's judgment was that the current standard of 75 parts per billion is not adequate to protect the public health. So she proposed to strengthen those standards to within a range of 65 to 70 parts per billion to better protect Americans' health and welfare. The agency invited comments on all aspects of the proposal, including an alternative levels as low as 60 parts per billion, and also acknowledged interest among some stakeholders in offering comment on retaining the existing standard. We also propose to update the air quality index for ozone to reflect a revised standard if one is finalized. The AQI is the tool that gives Americans real-time information about air quality each day so they can make informed choices to protect themselves and their families. Ozone seasons are lasting longer than they used to, so EPA proposed to lengthen the ozone monitoring season for 33 states to match the season when ozone levels can be elevated. To protect the environment from damaging levels of ground-level ozone as required by the Clean Air Act, the EPA has also proposed to revise the secondary standard. Based upon new studies that add to the evidence that repeated exposure to ozone reduces growth and has other harmful effects on plants and trees, the administrator judged that a secondary standard within the range of 65 to 75 parts per billion, the same as the primary standard proposal, would protect the public welfare, particularly against harm to trees, plants, and ecosystems. In addition, we have proposed to make updates to monitoring and permitting requirements, smooth the transition to any revised standards, maximize effectiveness in the state, local, tribal, and federal monitoring programs, and give areas new flexibilities to meet local needs for monitoring ozone precursors. 
All of these updates are designed to ensure that Americans are alerted when ozone approaches levels that may be unhealthy, especially for sensitive people. The administrator's proposal to strengthen the standards is designed to better protect children and families from the health effects of ozone pollution. For example, we estimate that meeting a level in the range of 65 to 70 parts per billion would prevent an estimated 330,000 to 1 million missed school days, 320,000 to 960,000 asthma attacks in children, and 710 to 4,300 or more premature deaths per year. Implementing ANACS has always been and will continue to be a federal, state, and tribal partnership. EPA stands ready to do our part to assist states and tribes with pollution control programs and to streamline implementation. Local communities, states, tribes, and EPA have already shown that we can reduce ground level ozone while our economy continues to thrive. We have reduced air pollution in this country by nearly 70% and our economy has tripled since 1970. We fully expect this progress to continue. Existing and proposed federal measures like vehicle standards, power plant rules are leading to substantial reductions in ozone nationwide, which will help improve air quality and help many areas meet any revised standards. We received over 430,000 comments during the 90-day public comment period, and we are reviewing those comments as we work towards completing the final standards by October 1st of this year. Thank you very much, and I look forward to your question. Thank you, uh, Ms. McKay, very much, and I recognize myself for five minutes of questions. Many of us believe that the Clean Air Act needs to be changed. I say that because, uh, just as Mr. Rush mentioned, you mentioned, uh, EPA looks at impact on health care by making it more stringent, these ozone rules, for example. And you eliminate so many cases of asthma, so many premature deaths, whatever, whatever, which is important. But un under the Act, you do not have any responsibility to look at those pockets of the country that are in noncompliance and the impact that these stringent controls have on jobs, and when we've had economist after economist come in here and talk about loss of jobs and the impact that that has on health care for children, for, for infants. And yet EPA, every time they come up here, it's all about the benefits, the benefits, the benefits. And there are detriments to these actions. Because when, a, you, you, as you know, when an area is in noncompliance, they can't build a new plant unless they can get a permit. They can't build infrastructure projects. And it does have an effect on jobs. Now, fortunately, areas like Los Angeles that have never been in compliance, uh, you know, they, they, they rely on the entertainment industry and high tech and so forth, so they don't have to worry about manufacturing jobs or basic industry jobs. But how do you account for the fact, for example, that uh, Los Angeles is still in noncompliance and your own rule states that some of these areas, the only way they will ever be in, in, in compliance under the, even the 2008 rule is they have to use unknown controls, controls that we don't know what it is. So, and you do understand, I mean, your own uh, testimony, your own documentation shows that many parts of the country are going to be in noncompliance, whether it's 70 or 65. And even President Obama tried to prevent the implementation. He delayed implementation of the most recent uh, review. Uh, and now, of, of course, environmentalist groups who do a good job, they have a role to play, but they're driving EPA because they're always going into court and under the strict construction of the language, sometimes which is quite nebulous, the courts say you cannot delay. So w w many of us are really frustrated that these environmental groups are, de are driving the decisions uh, because of the strict language in the original Clean Air Act. So I uh, hope, hope you get a sense of the frustration of many uh, parts of the country. In, in Kentucky, we're going to have 11 more counties in noncompliance uh, at 70. We're going to have 23 more at 65. 
in every major city in Kentucky would be in noncompliance uh, at, at some of these levels. So uh, are you concerned that uh, after all this time that areas like Los Angeles and San Joaquin still can't even meet the old standards? Chairman Whitfield, there's a, there's a lot in your, in your question there, and I'll, I'll try to address as much of it as I can. Um, there are certainly parts of the country where uh, meeting the health standard has been uh, extremely challenging uh, due to a variety of factors, including particular um, challenges in Southern California. What that means is that millions of people who live in those areas uh, are exposed to unhealthy air. Uh, the good news is that air quality has improved in Southern California as well as all across the country. Uh, but they're still in non-compliance. Uh, they, they do not meet the standard, but there are way fewer days. Um, and and there are uh, the, the levels are lower, and the area is making progress in a, in a way um, that still supports a, a vital local economy. And in how, fact, how much time does uh, Los Angeles have to comply? I mean, they're, they're, I don't know if they're severe or extreme, but mm -hmm. how many years do they have to comply? Um, Los Angeles Los Angeles is in the extreme category, um, and under um, if the standard is revised um, this fall, they would have until. Um, to, uh, 2037 to meet that standard. What that means is the area has a lot of time uh, to to bring uh, uh, reductions into into place. And but they've been working on it for 15 or 18 years. They're not even in compliance today. That's right. The air is still not healthy there for the citizens to breathe. And uh, well, I see my time's expired. But uh, you know. Many of us feel very strongly you should just continue to implement this existing rule for a while and give the country time to uh, catch up uh, since you're, even your implementing guidance has not been issued until just recently. Uh, I, I recognize the gentleman from Illinois for five minutes. Uh, I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, <clears throat> Assistant Administrator McCain, uh, in your written testimony, you know that nationally since 1980, average ozone levels have fallen by a third. Initially, 90% of the areas originally identified as not meeting the ozone, ozone standards set in 1997 now meet those standards, 97%. Uh, <clears throat> what would you say to the argument that we have already reduced our average ozone levels enough and furthering lowering the standards from 75 to 70 or even 65 will give us would not give us the additional health benefits worth the as opposed to the cost of uh, trying to reach those high, higher standards yeah well, Congress in the Clean Air Act directed EPA every five years to look at the science and make a determination about whether the current level is adequate to protect the public health. And based on all of that review in a very open uh, process with external peer review all along the way, um, the administrator made the determination that 75 parts per billion is not sufficiently protective. That's based on all of this science that we've seen that shows that people suffer the effects of of, of uh, air pollution, ozone air pollution at lo levels below 75 parts per billion. Um, that is her job to do under the Clean Air Act, um, and that is what our proposal is, is all about. Well, uh, you also point out that since 1980, we have reduced our air pollution by nearly 70 percent, and our economy has tripled. And we know that by law, EPA cannot consider the cost of implementing uh, either the primary or secondary uh, air quality standards, but only can consider the health benefits. Have there, have there been any cost-benefit analysis by the EPA or any other agency, either before, during, or after the proposed rule? Well, Ranking Member Rush, you're correct to point out that there's a separation that Congress laid out in the Clean Air Act between deciding what the science says um, is important for safe and healthy air and deciding 
um, how to meet that standard, um, which is uh, uh, the, the states are, are uh, in charge of because it's, it's their, um, uh, their air quality, their sources, with considerable help from the federal government. Uh, so we don't know exactly how the states will go about meeting the standard um, because they, we, we know that they will, as they have over the years, they will find cost-effective ways to do that um, with the help of uh, rules provided by the, the, the federal government. But we do provide as part of the rulemaking process, a regulatory impact analysis, an RIA, um, to show illustrative costs. Um, and that goes through uh, the review of the Office of Management and Budget and is done um, consistently uh, with the, the obligations and the requirements that, that, that they put on us to do those sorts of uh, economic reviews. Uh, Ms. McCabe, uh, the chairman uh, talked about Los Angeles and, uh, and other places. Uh, what's your viewpoints? What's your uh, why do they stand now? And and what and what direction uh, uh, is the EPA going to try to uh, bring them more into compliance? Uh, there are a lot of uh, pretty unique features that make Southern California very challenging uh, for air quality. It's obviously a very populous area, so there's a lot of activity there that creates emissions, but there's also the, the, um, the unique geography and topography of being uh, the mountains and the ocean and, and the meteorology there that just makes it very challenging. Uh, uh, a, as a result, um, EPA, as well as really progressive and, and smart and innovative uh, agencies and businesses in California have really led the way in figuring out how to reduce emissions in cost-effective ways to protect the citizens and improve air quality there. And EPA, in fact, has provided um, significant support and assistance uh, through grant programs, through technology uh, assistance over the years, and certainly um, uh, will continue to do that uh, in order to um, bring the kinds of programs that, that need to be in place there. Um, one of the advantages of that is that uh, California, the innovations in California, have, have helped the rest of the country uh, in terms of uh, uh, bringing new ideas and new approaches um, into use in ways that uh, can benefit the rest of the country and benefit the economy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. This time, I recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Olson, for five minutes. I thank the chair. Welcome back, Ms. McCabe. We all know that much of the ozone America is beyond our control. EPA calls this background ozone. Some of this ozone is natural. Those from other countries I have a slide here. This was Houston. Some of that is not our ozone. Some belongs to Mexico. We get it because of annual crop burnings. I have another poster. Last time Ms. McCarthy was here, I showed her this map of ozone pouring into America from China and Asia. In your proposal, you admit that natural ozone and ozone from Mexico and China can be a huge problem. Your rule says, and I quote, there are times where ozone levels approach or exceed the concentration levels being proposed in large part due to background sources, end quote. In small, Needville, Texas, you're saying that ozone we can't control makes us violate your new rules. That seems very unfair, ma'am. My first question is, is it true that nearly one half of the ozone America is here naturally or comes from overseas? I don't know that I would agree with, with that formulation exactly. We, we do address the background issue, and uh, background levels vary across the country, and they vary across different times of year. Um, and and as, as you know, they come from a variety of sources. I, I will note uh, that the Clean Air Act um, does not hold states responsible uh, for pollution that they do not uh, control. 
and there are uh, uh, provisions and mechanisms in the Clean Air Act uh, to uh, help states that Ma'am, I'm have sorry. That. I have only five minutes and thousands of questions back home. People would ask, so I've got to cut you off. I apologize. And also, in response to your answer goes against your own data. I mean, you admit, I'll give you copies of EPA's data that says more ozone is all over this country. Um, we know that natural and foreign ozone are not going away and are likely to get much, much bigger. That means we must squeeze more and squeeze more from smaller and smaller sources of ozone. EPA says, can't say how this can be achieved. You don't know. Is it true? The EPA says that much of the technology needed to meet these new rules are unknown today. Is that true, yes or no? I, I wouldn't characterize it as much of the technologies. We do recognize that in, in, in some parts of the country um, uh, there may need to be controls identified that, um, that are not in existence today. But there are many controls that are in existence today that can be implemented that will reduce the air pollution that causes ozone. Ma'am, one example. EPA admits that 43 percent of NOx controls needed in the Northeast are now unknown. Stark contrast to your answer. One other question. Is it true that EPA won't even consider whether an ozone rule is achievable? Is that true? Uh, in your I, formulation, I, will you consider, is this achieved? Can we do this with technology? Our job under the Clean Air Act is to identify the standard that is necessary to protect the public health. That's what this rule is about, is letting the American people know what is safe and healthy air for them to breathe. So you can't take into account achievability, just can't do that? By law, is that what you're saying, ma'am? That's, that's the, the Supreme Court has spoken to this, and uh, this is about the science and about what's healthy for the American people. Well, it sounds like we need to change that law. One final question, ma'am. The law does not require, as you know, EPA to change the ozone rule every five years. You just have to review it, as you said in your opening comments. You say you have to change the current rule because the 2008 rule doesn't protect human health. And yet, back home, the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality points out that your own modeling in your, quote, health and risk exposure assessment Appendix 7, page 73-2, end quote, would result in more deaths in Houston, Texas, with a lower standard. TCEQ concludes that either the EPA can't read their own data or you're accepting a lower ozone standard that makes health worse. And it comes back to that fact, ma'am? Um, I would very much disagree with the way TCEQ uh, characterized the data, and if, if you look at the entire body of data that you will see uh, that the health benefits of the proposed ozone standard are substantial. We welcome everybody's comment on the rule, and TCEQ has provided a, a lot of analysis, which we're looking very closely at. I'll make you a deal, get a copy of their assessment, have it to you today, ma'am. Thank you very much. Yield time has expired. This time, right now, the gentleman from El uh, California, Mr. McNerney, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Ms. McCabe. Um, I, uh, in your, early in your testimony and also in response to Mr. Rush's question, you said that you looked at thousands of reports, a thousand more recent reports, uh, then it concluded that to protect the health and safety of the communities, uh, 75 was a little too high. Now, are we splitting hairs here, or are we talking about large-scale effects? Uh, we're talking about millions of people that are uh, suffering the effects of ozone pollution that at a lower level would not suffer those effects. So the EPA's, one of the EPA's primary mission is to protect the health of this country and, and our communities. Uh, was there a rule recently that uh, ensured that the EPA must look at health uh, and safety of the community first before looking at economic impacts? Uh, that, that's exactly what courts have said with regard to setting these air quality standards, yes. Thank you. Um, I, I, uh, the, the chairman mentioned um, San Joaquin Valley, which is my home, so I appreciate your attention, Mr. Chairman. Um, but I've seen 
uh, over the last several years improvement year by year in the air quality in our community. And I, uh, I think a lot of this is due to uh, the kind of standards that the EPA has initiated. Um, and one of the things that uh, we do is incentivize uh, some of the old diesel equipment to be replaced by new diesel equipment. But that takes time. That's not something we can require all the farmers or, or diesel truck uh, owners to do over a period of a year or two. It takes time. So I appreciate that we're going to continue uh, to look at those uh, and keep those standards in place. Um, and I just want to say uh, the Bay Area uh, contributes a lot of the uh, ozone to the San Joaquin Valley, uh, um, sort of like what Mr. Olson was saying. Uh, we get a lot of it from outside of our region, so we ask you to take special consideration to that in helping us make uh, those attainments and in the sort of uh, um, penalties that are assessed when you don't make those attainments. And I appreciate Mr. Olson's comments on that. Um, what is the EPA going to do uh, or how is the ABA going to assess uh, drought impacts on, on air pollution and ozone? Yeah, we, so we know that uh, the, the drought situation is inc incredibly severe and challenging and troubling um, in California and elsewhere. Um, that can uh, contribute to uh, poor air quality because of increased dust. Um, but we also have um, uh, tools in the Clean Air Act that can allow states to evaluate their air quality um, as it's being influenced by, by natural conditions um, such as that. Um, and we're working closely with the states to make sure that our guidance and expectations are, are current um, with, with situations like drought and wildfires, which are um, also a challenge to make sure that, that states um, aren't responsible for uh, natural conditions and, and that sort of thing that, that can create ozone situations. Would you confirm my uh, observation that the air quality is improving in the San Joaquin Valley? Yes, sir. Uh, yes, I certainly would. Do you have uh, some, something you could say here? about that? Um, well, I don't have, have figures with me, uh, Congressman, although we'd be happy to get those to you. But, um, but certainly over uh, recent years, air quality has been improving, and it's, it's due to uh, the kinds of programs that, that you mentioned, um, replacing um, older, dirtier engines with cleaner, newer ones, and, and working very closely with, uh, with the agricultural community and, 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 uh, and everybody in uh, the San Joaquin Valley to, to find sensible things to do. So non-attainment doesn't penalize us in the sense of, of, of backtracking uh, the actual air quality in the region? No, no, not at all. It's, it's all moving in, in the right direction. Thank you. Could you explain the difference between secondary standards and primary standards? Yes. Um, primary standards are intended, are focused on public protecting human health. Uh, secondary standards are focused, um, as uh, the Clean Air Act says, in protecting public welfare. So those are other things that we care about as, um, as people who live in this country, um, economic impacts, uh, effects on ecosystems, effects on crops, effects on, um, on buildings, um, the, the, the other things that, that um, make our economy and our uh, quality of life what it, what it is. Okay, so then you said... Uh, you're going to set the, the primary and secondary standards the same with regard to ozone. Well, it turns out we, we do an independent analysis of the information mm. that exists on, on human health and then on these secondary impacts, um, and there's an extensive discussion of that um, in the uh, preamble and the proposal, and, and our Clean Air Act Science Advisory Committee spoke to that directly. Um, our uh, review of the science shows that um, a, a standard set in the range of 65 to, to 70 will provide the protection um, that, the, that the welfare impacts, that the science tells us the welfare impacts require. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This time I recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Shimkus, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Mr. Sec Assistant Administrator, welcome. It's good to have you back. Um, this is uh, personally, just, just you as an individual, don't you believe that having a good paying job with health benefits is also protective of human health? I, I, I think it's important for everybody to have a job and, 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 and health and health care benefits yes, of yes, some I do. sort. Of course I do. And that's part of our, I mean, when you hear the questions and the responses back and forth, that's kind of our, part of our challenge is, especially as I follow up on this question, is that you all, as an EPA, don't really have an, the authority to evaluate that with respect to your primary mission, which is protective of human health via the air regulations. 
that right? I mean, you just can't weigh in. You're not making those uh, cost-benefit analysis. We say we are to some extent, but they're so far down the decision tree that many of us believe that they just don't happen. Um, so let, let me go to another question based upon a, a comment you made, because a lot of this is 75 parts per billion in 2008, many states have not met those yet, but now we're ratcheting down even more, and there's a lot of uncertainty. Now, that'll, that'll move on to my third question once I get there. But in your response, you talked about background is different in different areas. So are you considering a different regulation standard based upon the variance of background? So could some, one area of the country have a 70 parts per billion and another one have a 65 parts per billion? Well, and if, yeah, answer the question, yeah, I can yeah, follow sure. up. Well, the, the standard is, is supposed to reflect what is safe for, for people to breathe. Um, and so a child living in Florida and a child living in Oregon um, should be entitled to the... To but the background is background. Background is there without, in essence, human contact. That's right. And that comes into play um, when states are putting their plans together and EPA is working with states to, uh, to figure out um, how much time and what needs to be done in order to, to reach those standards so that areas that have more But challenges. you can't. But if an area has 70 parts per billion background... You can't get them to 65 but the, through, the, through the power of government. But there, but there are two very important elements to the standard. One is for the people who live in that area to know whether the air that they're breathing is healthy or not. So, so they should move. They, is, that the, is that the answer? Uh, get out of that 70 parts per billion area because it's not healthy. No, but they should know that when the air quality is bad, um, that, that they might want to... What, what should they do? It's well, naturally occurring. That's the yeah, background. Right. But, but understand, too, that, that ozone changes from day to day. And, and there are... Uh, so they should take are, a vacation during those days. You, you see our problem. The, I think it, in rolling this out, I would hope that... I, background's important. Background should be a standard. Uh, we should not try to have government force something that's nat not naturally occurring based upon nature without man's intervention. If I, if I could clarify um, a point or, uh, on the background, uh, because uh, I, I think it may be, um, uh, people may be thinking that, that there's, uh, uh, this is pervasive. In fact, across the country, most of the ozone that is contributing to high values is locally or regionally created. There are very few areas, very few parts of this country, uh, where background can get as high as um, a approaching the level. Okay, but you understand our concern, even if it's very low possibility. If, if anyway, so I want to move on to the last question. Uh, do, we just finished our congressional baseball game last night. We lost again, um, but it makes me think about what uh, Chairman Whitfield was addressing. Had we started the game and then halfway through the game, the strike zone changed, or in the second inning, the number of outs changed, or the fourth inning, the uh, foul lines changed, or the outfield walls got moved in, that would make for a very frustrating, impossible game. Don't you would agree? But this is about, ozone is not about rules, it's about science. This is about utility MAC, boiler MAC, cement rule, cross eight air pollution, 111D, 111B, ozone, different standards, particulate matter, tier three. We're changing the rules on the fly, and the people who are creating jobs in this country cannot manage it. And that's our problem with what's going on with the EPA. And I yield back my time. This time right now, the gentleman from California, Ms. Caps, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing. Thank you, Ms. McCabe, for your testimony. And maybe it's the bias because I have been a public health nurse a long time. But when it comes to air quality, I believe our focus must be primarily on protecting public health. This is the standard set by Congress in the Clean Air Act. It's a standard that's been upheld by the Supreme Court, and for good reason. Clean air has very real and significant impacts on the health and well-being of all 
Americans, and this was underscored by our ranking member, Bobby uh, Rush uh, from Chicago, where they know a thing or two about air pollution too. Healthier children, parents and employees, translate into very real economic benefits. Um, I would say to my colleague, Mr. Shimkus, uh, who made a case in the other direction, uh, that good jobs with health benefits, which he was arguing for, are even better <laughs> uh, in the uh, context of clean air. Uh, and even polluters benefit from healthier employees taking fewer sick days. Uh, so my question is just asking you to elaborate on this fact. What is the economic value? Yeah, um, it, it's absolutely true, and, and, and I think um, um, many agree that, that a clean and healthy environment is uh, very positive for the economy as well as for public health. Um, we, our illustrative uh, analysis shows that um, at a standard of 60 parts per billion, uh, there would be uh, benefits in the range of 6.4 to $13 billion to the economy, yeah. um, and for 65 parts per billion, 19 to $38 billion. And that comes from some of the things that you've cited, which is um, missed... Uh, uh, Fewer yeah. missed school days, few, uh, less missed work, uh, fewer visits to the emergency room, right. that sort of thing. Some oppose strengthening ozone standards, and we've heard it today, because it would increase the number of non-attainment areas. Um, and Ms. McCabe, does the Clean Air Act require EPA to set ozone standards based on how many areas currently meet that standard or based on protecting public health? It's based on protecting public health. And for those areas that need to make improvements, and many of these are in my home state of California, uh, what resources are available to help lower the ozone layers? I mean, I think the word smog was invented in the Los Angeles area. I live just a tiny bit to the north of it, but we still struggle every day. Are, are these areas on their own, or does the federal government provide assistance? Um, absolutely. This is a partnership between the federal government and the state governments. Um, the federal government assists in a number of ways. Um, uh, one is by um, uh, promulgating national rules like Tier 3, which apply to automobiles nationwide, right. um, uh, bring tremendous benefits, um, and, and other uh, rules that make sense to do at a national level. We also help the states by providing um, uh, financial assistance and, and support, technical assistance, and grants, um, and, and your area has has um, certainly benefited from those sorts of programs that can be very targeted to the specific needs of a particular area. Thank you. And as you know well, and I'd like to turn to the topic of climate change just briefly, uh, this is inc increasingly impacting all aspects of our economy and our daily lives. Storms are getting stronger. Floods are getting worse. Droughts, as I know very well in California now, and wildfires are getting more severe. And climate change also increases the levels of ozone in the air we breathe. Would you explain just very simply how climate change is expected to impact ozone levels and how will this affect our human health? Um, sure. Um, as the climate gets warmer, um, warm conditions are what um, is conducive to ozone formation. So, so uh, it can in lead to increased um, ozone, ozone formation. And circularly, ozone is also a climate um, pollutant, so it helps contribute to the kinds of effects that we are seeing. And then just briefly, finally, I hear so often the uh, industry as well as some uh, uh, here in Congress cite high cost estimates as a reason to oppose strengthening environmental and public health standards. It's the same argument being used against the proposed ozone standards. While I believe costs of new regulations should certainly be considered, and there is a way that you're talking about doing that, uh, these costs must also be weighed against the benefits. It's important to remember that health benefits estimate real, uh, uh, represent real people and real lives saved. So how, how do the estimated health benefits of EPA's proposed ozone standards compare to the costs? In other words, what is that balance, that um, trade-off? Yeah, as, as we laid out in our illustrative case, the benefits outweigh the costs by $3 to everyone that's spent. And this is based on studies that actually do demonstrate this? Um, it, it's based on all the information that, that is available to us about the, the, the things that people are likely to do and the costs associated with the cost benefits associated with the health benefits. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, and I yield back. This time, I recognize the gentleman from Mississippi, Mr. Harper, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for being here today. It seems like you, you do hang out here quite a bit, so I, it's uh, good to have you back. I do. I'm happy to. Well, look, just a, a, a quick question. If we were able to somehow eliminate all ground level ozone, there would still be people that would have respiratory illnesses. You would agree with that, wouldn't you? 
Sure, there's lots of r things that sure. contribute to respiratory illness. And as we learn how to measure more minute levels of, of uh, any type of, uh, of, of item, that uh, is something that we, I know we have to look at. But I'm really concerned as we look at this, if we uh, revise the current ozone standards, how that's going to affect uh, transportation conformity requirements. And so if you could just briefly say what are transportation, what transportation conformity, what does that mean? Transportation conformity is a, uh, a provision in the act that, um, that wants to make sure that as states and, and municipalities are working to improve their air quality, that transportation planning is taken to, into is taken into account and that transportation planning takes air quality into account so that so that areas won't undermine their efforts to improve air quality um, inadvertently uh, through transportation projects that will that could increase air pollution so states and localities will have that responsibility they they do, they do have that Obviously. now and 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 working with mm. the federal government and in order to make that uh, demonstration Mm -hmm. What kind of modeling tools will these cities need uh, to use? Well, there are tools that are in existence now and uh, tools that, that EPA and Federal Highway um, provides that we work with the states on to, to, to analyze um, the, those, those impacts. Well, how, We've been doing this for a long time. All right. how, re how reasonable or what type of uh, situation is it for smaller cities? What, what about those that uh, have that? Are you expecting the smaller cities... Uh, to do the same analysis, and is that reasonable, and, and what are you anticipating? We would certainly provide any assistance that we needed to for any community. Um, th th this is, this is um, a, a, a focus in larger communities, more populous communities, uh, but we would provide whatever assistance was All needed to have. All right. So if the focus is for larger communities, mm -hmm. are you planning on extending it to every community? Um, it, the, the Clean Air Act provides the, the, the areas that need to look at transportation conformity, so we would um, follow the, the guidance and the requirements in the Act and the regulation. So if EPA allowed existing federal uh, measures to work, existing now, wouldn't many cities avoid having to do these time-consuming transportation conformity analyses? Well, we, we actually, our RIA um, looks at um, the, what we expect to happen to air quality in the future, looking at the rules that are in place now and the ones that are um, under development now. And we show that um, the vast majority of the areas that right now um, would have levels in exceeding these standards um, uh, by 2025 will, co will come into attainment of those standards uh, through these measures. You know, we have lots of uh, important issues, and, and one of those issues is what to do about our highway bridges, infrastructure uh, issues that we have in this country. Uh, and, and many of those need to be repaired. We need new ones that uh, need to be uh, built. Uh, stringent ozone standards obviously can make it harder for states to show that proposed highway projects conform with ozone standards. Has EPA considered the economic and safety impacts that could result if these stringent, more stringent ozone standards block crucial transportation projects? I don't, I don't think that we anticipate or has, have historically seen that conformity blocks um, important transportation projects, especially ones that are needed for, for safety reasons. Well, you haven't seen that under the current, but if we have more, uh, more stringent requirements and that uh, causes additional costs, do you see, can you explain that? I, I, I don't expect that the, that the system would work differently in, in any areas. We, we don't expect um, a, a lot of new areas uh, to be coming into non-attainment under these standards, so, so the areas are, uh, are generally familiar with and already working with the transportation conformity um, system. But, but all of the provisions that are in there about making sure that um, important safety projects go forward um, and other important projects go forward, th those, those will all uh, continue to apply. Thank you. And I yield back. Chair, recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Green, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, welcome, Mr. McCabe. Uh, has previously EPA ever delayed the NOx standard? The, the, the NOx standard? Yeah. The, um, the, uh, the, there's the, the NO2 standard, maybe that's what you're referring to. E EPA in, in past has not always met its deadlines, I would say. Um, okay. on, on well, that's standards. the other thing. Um, if EPA hadn't delayed the standards, 
when the law would require EPA to review the uh, uh, ozone standard again, what would be the regular timeline? Would it be 2015? Uh, the, 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 the last time the ozone standard was, uh, was revised was in 2008. Clean Air Act says every five years, so 2013 would have been uh, five years. Okay. In your testimony, you stated EPA examined the thousands of scientific studies, including more than 1,000 new studies published since EPA last revised the standard. The ozone uh, NOx proposal, EPA acknowledged there is a brand new scientific data the EPA couldn't consider. Also, EPA states there's a significant uncertainties regarding some of the studies that EPA did include regarding the lowering of standard. Most importantly, by 2017, the following standards would be in place that would significantly affect ozone and precursors. Ozone NOx at 75 parts per billion, tier three vehicle emission standards, mercury and air toxic standards uh, from the utility MAC, new source performance standards uh, for volatile organic compounds and particulate matter that NOx would also Im is important because EPA acknowledges reduction of particulate matter would account for two-thirds to three-fourths of those ozone NOx benefits. Why is lowering the standard not more appropriate after the 75 parts per billion standard has time to take effect and EPA reviews all the new and related information and data, say 2017? Well, uh, because the Clean Air Act gives us a timetable of, of every five years and, and we're, we're late on that, and because this is about uh, letting the American people know what is healthy air quality for them. Well, uh, in earlier, Knox, the EPA stated in earlier decisions, based on the applicable sta statutory requirements and the volume of material requiring careful evaluation, the EPA estimates it will take two to three years to incorporate over a, a thousand new health studies and criteria documents. Given various legal constraints and the fact that EPA has already missed deadlines for completion of ozone review cycles, the administrator concluded that the best action, uh, course of action would be to complete the current review based on the existing air standard and proceed as rapidly as possible with the next review. Why would, uh, why would EPA not make a similar decision now since we're in 2015 now? Because uh, we are now in that regular review. Um, we are past our statutory deadline. Um, and in fact, we're, uh, we're subject to a, a court schedule to, to uh, finalize this rule. Well, uh, my earlier question, there have been times that EPA has delayed it in the past. Is that true? They're, they're, on our regularly required five-year review, yes. there, there have been times when we have not met that deadline. I think you're referring to the ozone reconsideration, which was not a mandatory requirement under the Clean Air Act. Uh, but okay. for our mandatory five-year review cycle, uh, we have not deliberately delayed. We have missed deadlines, and, um, and we're in that situation now. I guess the concern I have, and, and you've heard it from other members, is that we haven't met the current standard, and yet we're getting ready to see some really things happen. And so to put a new standard on with all this is um, uh, maybe starting too early before we see what the benefits are of the other things that... Uh, that the industries and everyone else is complying with. And again, EPA has delayed it in the past, uh, but you know, for a two-year delay, while all these other uh, things come into, come into play, and we'll have better data then uh, I, to be able to look at it. I, I will say, Congressman Green, that, that the effect of, of those various measures will affect air quality. And so uh, if, the, if a standard is revised and, uh, and folks need to look at which areas do and don't meet the standard, all of those programs like mercury and air toxics standard tier three will be bringing air quality down so that fewer areas um, will be in non-attainment uh, and, and those programs will provide assistance in order to improve air quality in those areas. Mr. Chairman, one of my concerns is that part of our particulate matter in my area is because of the lack of infrastructure improvements. And so uh, we could actually be hindering those infrastructure improvements if we make it more difficult. And, uh, but anyway, I'm out of time, but I appreciate you being here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This time I recognize a gentleman from West Virginia, Mr. McKinley, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, what's the time frame in, in uh, getting some written? Because I don't think we're going to be in our five minutes to be able to get through our questions. Uh, is there a time frame to be able to submit written questions? 
Yeah, 10 days. Okay, within 10 days, thank you. Uh, welcome back. Uh, my, my question uh, is that uh, should a rule like this uh, that helps public health um, be, uh, be withheld? Uh, be withheld because of a, a regulatory burden that we've been referring to here? I, I'm not sure I understand your question, Congressman. Well, if there's, there's a regulatory burden that's uh, going to be imposed with this, uh, should the EPA uh, withhold the bill uh, well, the, or the rule? Well, the, the, the Clean Air Act uh, directs EPA to, to set the standards, and the Supreme Court has said that um, that, that is our job to do and that the, the issues related to implementation um, are a separate con matter, matter of separate consideration uh, not to be considered well, this, in okay, determining the, what the so proper the court's public ruled on health that, level. So I'm just curious, because it goes back that, uh, and you've heard it several times mentioned here, that the, uh, the president did step in and, and say there were some this was going to cause regulatory burden, uh, and therefore he asked that the rule be held back for a period of time. Mm -hmm. um, that's an accurate statement, isn't it, that the president did intercede? Uh, that, that, was, that was in a, a reconsideration event, which okay, is... Okay, that was in 2011. And I'm just curious. Uh, uh, so um, I guess I'm, I'm, uh, part of me, is, part of the question is, what's changed uh, uh, if he felt that this rule should not have proceeded because it had regulatory burdens with it? What's improved since 2011 that is it going to be less burdensome to industry? No, the, the decision to... to no, just um, those were his words, uh, uh, the, the, the Director, decision uh, that to, he just said if, if it has a regulatory burden, I think we should hold it back. I, uh, I, I respectfully, I disagree that, that, that that's what he, what he said, Congressman. The, that, that decision was made in the context of knowing that there would be the required five-year review, and, and, and the decision there was to defer and, and uh, stop with the reconsideration process in deference to the review that no, was no, no, He right just said there. to underscore the importance of reducing regulatory burden and regulatory uncertainty. Um, I have requested the Administrator Jackson to withdraw the draft ozone uh, uh, standards. Uh, uh, I think that's, that's interesting because I'm curious to see what's changed. How the, how the economy has improved or the regulatory burden is less. But uh, you've answered about as much. I, I just limited questions here at time on this. I'm, I'm just curious a little bit about uh, how a county is supposed to work um, in, in actual functioning through it. I've got, of the, my 20 counties that I represent, 75% of those counties are going to be in noncompliance if you go to 65. 75%. So how are they supposed to... Uh, in, in a real world, not, not from academia, but how are they supposed to function when they're going to be in a non-attainment county? 75% of my counties, 15 of those counties are going to be in non What are they supposed to do? Well, um, th there are uh, counties all across the country that um, have experienced poor air quality, have been designated non-attainment in the past, um, and, and states work with those counties to get programs in place to improve air quality in those give areas. Give me an example. Give me a, don't, you're talking air, yeah. you know, 30,000 feet. Okay. Let's go down to how, how are they going to change the air quality in, in Jefferson County, West Virginia, that has it right now is at 81. Okay. Well, I, I can talk more, um, uh, uh, I can talk better about my own home state of Indiana. No, please I was, just talk, well, the, this, these are just three counties in a row. They, they average 73. So they're already going to be so far over. Are we telling them? and their kids and their families, when they sit at that kitchen table when they can't get a job, it's because their air quality is, is, is it was fine at 75, but now that they get to 65, there's no jobs coming to West Virginia? So what, what states do um, in non-attainment situations is they, they look at the local sources of, of air pollution and put in place um, uh, sensible measures to reduce those, and it might be um, local industry, it might be... Uh, uh, what, 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 okay, local industry, you're telling that local industry to change how it produce... Uh, local industry has controlled air pollution remarkably um, over the years. I come from Indiana, I was the air director there. Um, we have an area in northwest Indiana that... Has we have some counties in, in like Tyler County, and, and they may have just... Uh, well, I won't give them... We have some counties just have one industry, right? Uh, yet right. they're not in attainment. And and there are many counties for which the 
from which the air pollution is not generated right within that county, but it's generated regionally. Right. That's why states work with um, metropolitan areas. That's why um, the Clean Air Act has provisions to make sure that if, if upwind states are contributing to downwind states, that those upwind states take responsibility. That's why EPA uh, moves forward with federal programs, uh, such as the Tier 3, which makes um, uh, auto, uh, motor okay. vehicle traffic I, much cleaner I, I'll everywhere, get back. I'd like to have more of a written state. answer from you on that, because I've got a series. I want to follow a, a, a metric. So how are we going to go down through to make a, so their job opportunity? I want to close very quickly. Why, were, why are the tribes excluded from this, this, uh, this re regulation? The, the, the tribes aren't excluded. Um, the tribes have the opportunity to, um, to, to uh, uh, regulate themselves, and if not, then But the e proposal then says the tribes are not obligated to adopt or implement any of the ambient air quality standards for ozone. In addition, tribes are not obligated to conduct ambient monitoring for ozone or to adopt the ambient monitoring requirements. Uh, the that sounds the, like an exemption to me. No, the federal government implements the standards in, in Indian country unless a tribe um, chooses to, to uh, seek to do it itself. So the standards apply in Indian country. Um, uh, regulations get put in place in Indian country. Um, it's just that the federal government has the uh, initial responsibility to do that. I'll just, I know I'm way over time. I'll just be curious how they're going to change their operation. Thank you. Gentleman's time has expired, and he can submit those uh, questions. At this time, we recognize the gentlelady from Florida, Ms. Castor, for five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for calling this hearing, and, and welcome. Um, you know, I, listening to uh, my colleagues' comments today uh, takes me back to the time I, when I was younger. Now, the Clean Air Act was originally adopted by the Congress in the 1960s. Is that right? Yes. And there, were, there have been significant amendments yeah. in the 1970s and, and especially in 1990. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think back to, to we've all kind of lived through this era, and I don't think anyone can argue that America is better off because we breathe cleaner air. And we've been able to balance uh, environmental progress with economic progress. We have the strongest e economy in the world today. Uh, yes, we have our challenges. We've had our setbacks. But we've been able to combine environmental progress, cleaner air, cleaner water, uh, oversight of chemicals with uh, economic progress and good jobs. Uh, I remember very well in the late 60s and 1970s walking outside uh, in my home in Tampa, Florida, and the air was awful. It was, and it, we're, we're a warm climate, so we have very smoggy days. Now it's, uh, it's much better. It's noticeably better. And anyone that lived in the 60s and 70s, whether you were in an industrial area or not, you, you understand the progress that we've made. So I want to thank you for uh, your attention to, to cleaner air that we breathe. What a, what a privilege it is to live in a country that has been able to uh, show such environmental stewardship and balance it against economic progress. Uh, and that's the history of this country. And I'm confident that we can continue to make that kind of, of progress. Now, Ms. McCabe, what is the ozone standard right now? 75 parts per billion. And what does that mean exactly? Um, that, that means that um, in a, a billion units of air, uh, no more than 75 of those should be ozone in order to, to provide um, healthy air quality. And how long has it been at the 75? Uh, that was adopted in 2008. And what was it before that time? Um, it was 85. So, uh, and now the proposal, EPA's proposal, um, uh, directed by the court, directed by the Congress, in statute is to go uh, uh, where now? Um, what the administrator proposed was a level somewhere between 65 and 75 parts per billion. And that was after significant discussion by the Clean Air Scientific Advisory Committee. What is the Clean Air Scientific Advisory Committee? Um, that is a, um, an external uh, expert advisory panel uh, that EPA convenes um, and uh, has assisted us uh, with all reviews of national ambient air quality standards. So it's a, a special panel convened to, uh, to review all of the science 
that EPA develops, our Office of Research and Development and the Office of Air and Radiation, and they go through a very lengthy process of reviewing multiple documents, both um, science documents and then, and then policy documents, uh, and give us feedback on the science that we're looking at. So they considered uh, all sorts of levels. Oh, yes, right, right. And they looked at all the studies that, 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 that we lacked, that looked at. They considered all of that information and in our evaluation of it. And in fact, that committee indicated that it, and it concluded that there is adequate scientific evidence to recommend a range of levels for a revised primary ozone standard from 70 parts per billion to 60 parts per billion. Uh, and with regard to the upper bound of 70 parts per billion, the committee said, based on the scientific evidence, a level of 70 parts per billion provides little margin of safety for protection of public health, particularly for its sensitive subpopulations, like children, and the elderly, folks with, with respiratory problems. Although a level of 70 parts per billion is more protective of public health than the current standard, it may not meet the statutory requirement to protect public health with an adequate margin of safety. What are they saying there? Um, well, uh, they're, they're acknowledging, first of all, that, that um, it's the administrator's job to make this judgment about uh, what protects the public health with an adequate margin of safety. Uh, what they're saying is that they looked at all of this information and that they see evidence in the, in the science record um, uh, from the level of 70 uh, down to a level of 60 uh, that shows adverse impacts on, on public health um, from, from ozone at these levels of exposure. Um, and what they're saying is that at the top end of the range, there, there is less cushion, there's less margin of safety than at lower levels within that range. So this was taken into account as you develop, as the administrator developed the proposal? It was. So, and I mean, when you, when you consider that the public health benefits for children, the el elderly, uh, respiratory diseases. I mean, we all know someone in our family or we know someone with asthma. 26 million people in the U.S. Uh, are estimated to have asthma. 7 million children. Certainly we can continue the environmental progress to improve the public health and balance it against uh, the economic needs of the country. I think this is the United States of America and it can be done. So thank you for staying true to the law. Thank you. recognize the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Griffith, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, as you know, I represent a fairly rural uh, district. It includes uh, the Appalachian Mountains, the Appalachian Trail, the Blue Ridge Mountains, uh, Stone's Throw from the Smokies. Um, my understanding is, is that, uh, that under EPA requirements in order to construct a new source uh, of emissions or expand an existing source, there's a need to find offsets. Is that Accurate. It, it, it depends uh, on, uh -huh. on how an area is, is designated. Um, so uh, areas that um, are, are the, the least um, uh, polluted areas in terms of, of ozone, um, uh, the, the, it, it, it changes as the area gets more and more um, uh, severely polluted. Okay. Uh, Kentucky's air regulator has raised concerns about the impacts on rural counties. In particular, he stated the statutory and regulatory offset requirements will severely restrict economic development in these rural counties since, by definition, the areas have no existing offset emissions available for any new sources. Rural counties would be disproportionately negatively impacted with little opportunity for economic development. For rural counties, would states be able to seek relief from some of these offset requirements? There's actually a provision in the Clean Air Act that's specifically uh, focused on rural counties um, that, that um, may be in non-attainment uh, because of transported air pollution. So we would uh, work with any state that wanted to uh, come forward and talk about rural counties. Well, you represented, or you said, uh, transported uh -huh. uh, ozone. The problem that, that I fear that some of my areas may have with the newer requirements as well is that it's not transported, but it's natural. Uh, as you know, uh, trees produce uh, volatile orga organic compounds, which combined with sunlight produce ozone. Thus the name Smoky Mountains, thus the name Blue Ridge Mountains, because the mountains themselves with their trees produce uh, ozone. So it's not necessarily transported ozone, mm -hmm. it's ozone because we are in fact rural and have trees that produce uh, some of this. It's not 80% as Ronald Reagan once said, mm -hmm. but it is a significant contributor 
particularly in the rural areas like mine in, in the eastern Appalachians. Um, in fact, Scientific American in the June 1st, uh, 2014 story singled out or said that, the, according to their research, black gum, poplar, oak, and willow are significant uh, producers of vol volatile organic compounds. So is there anything that would give us that offset, or do we have to go out into the forests, national or private, and say you got to cut the black gum, the poplar, the oak, and the willow, but it's okay to leave the birch, the linden, and the tulip, which apparently are low producers of, of VOCs or, vo or volatile organic compounds. Well, as I, as I mentioned in response to a previous question, what our science shows is that, that the areas that, that have significant challenges with, with background ozone um, are in the, um, the, the uh, Rocky Mountains, the higher elevation areas. Uh, we're not seeing uh, that kind of a, a situation with background in, in other areas of the country. So you think the central Appalachians will be okay? I, I, I do. But what about this offset? If it's, it's not well, transported, would that rule so, would so, that rule also cover naturally occurring ozone? So as we, as we look forward, mm -hmm. um, I'd, uh, I'd be happy to get you this information, uh, Mr. Do. Griffith, on 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 uh, Virginia particularly. But as uh, we look at areas that are likely to be in non-attainment, um, we will look at um, air quality in future years to make those determinations. Um, and I, I, I don't think we're seeing um, widespread non-attainment in, in rural areas. Uh, but, but in the, those areas where we do, um, there are opportunities there uh, to, to work with those areas. All right, I, I appreciate the opportunity to work on it. I am concerned about it. Uh, I'm gonna have to ask you some of these questions uh, offline because time is, is precious uh, and we don't get but so much. Uh, but if you could uh, get us just some basic process on what the states have to do, what is the process for reviewing the state implementation plans, what is the range of time this process can take to complete, mm -hmm. months or years, mm -hmm. and if the EPA doesn't approve, and I guess this is one I'll ask you to answer at this time, if the EPA doesn't approve a state's implementation plan, what happens to the state? Does it become subject to a federal plan? And will there then be litigation between the states and the EPA over that? Yeah. Um, so uh, the, the Clean Air Act lays out a lot of steps. Depending on the severity of the area, that, that um, dictates how much time the states have. But typically, if, if an area is considered, uh, most areas the last time around were designated as marginal non-attainment, uh, which means that they were not obliged to do a plan because um, they were expected to come into attainment, and, and, and many do. Um, for ones that are moderate or above, uh, they, they typically have three years to put a plan together. Uh, EPA works with those states to try to make sure that those plans are going what to be What happens if their state plan is not approved? Um, uh, generally, we work back and forth with the state uh, to, to, to get it to a place where it's, it, it's approvable. But what if it's not? What do you do? Well, you come up if, with a federal plan? If, if, if a state really didn't want to, to, to make a plan that was approvable, which most states do, um, the, the Clean Air Act does provide that EPA would, would step into a federal plan. But uh, I have to say that that is um, very, very rare in this situation, because both because states want to, to do their plans um, uh, because they are possible to do them and because we, uh, we work hard with the state. But to in, make and sure I've, gotta, I've gotta go, but in those places where they don't want to because you've made the standards so low, you may see more litigation. Thank you. This time right now is a gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Pallone, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Some of my colleagues are quick to argue that EPA's proposed ozone standard will hurt the economy, but history tells us that cleaning up pollution can benefit the economy as well as human health and the environment. Since its enactment in 1970, the Clean Air Act provides a perfect example of how we can make steady progress in cleaning up the air while growing the economy. So, Ms. McCabe, do we have to choose between clean air and economic growth? What does the history of the Clean Air Act tell us about our ability to cut pollution while building the economy? It actually shows us that the two things go hand in hand. We've reduced pollution dramatically, air pollution dramatically in this country. The economy has grown. We've also shown that uh, this country has, uh, and businesses in this country have innovated, have come up with pollution control technologies that employ American workers and uh, make us leaders in the world on, on selling this kind of technology. When we talk about air pollution regulation, my Republican colleagues often focus on costs, but they aren't talking about the cost from exposure to unsafe air. They're talking about the cost to polluters of actually cleaning up their act. So again, Ms. McCabe, how do the costs and benefits of implementing the proposed ozone standards stack up? 
Uh, well, um, we, we look at both. We lay both of those out. Um, and in our uh, analysis that we put out with our proposed rule, um, it showed that the benefits of this rule w would outweigh the costs by three to one. And uh, along those lines, the National Association of Manufacturers estimates the cost of this rule would be $140 billion annually, making the new ozone standard the most expensive rulemaking in history. My understanding is that EPA's cost estimate, approved by the Office of Management and Budget, was much lower. So will you tell us how much does EPA expect this standard to cost? Yes, uh, um, our estimates, and again, these are illustrative because the states will make their own choices, but, um, but our estimates are that at a level of 65 parts per billion, um, uh, it would be in the range of 19 to 38 billion in the uh, first standard of 70 parts per billion. Uh, oh, sorry, I said that completely wrong. Um, the costs are uh, range from 3.9 billion to 15 billion, uh, depending on where the standard is. So this, based on your experience, that $140 billion price tag uh, doesn't seem reasonable to you. It, it, it does not match our uh, evaluation. Yeah, I mean, this, this concentration on costs, I think, has been misguided. Over, over the history of the Clean Air Act, industry has consistently exaggerated the potential costs of controlling pollution. Uh, how, how have these doomsday predictions measured up to reality? Well, um, they, they haven't, um, in, in, given the information that uh, folks have, have in front of them. Um, in 1997, there were similar um, c claims made that uh, the 1997 standards were going to uh, uh, kill the economy, and that ha it absolutely hasn't come true. You know, I, I, I just wanted to ask you something based on some of my Republican colleagues, and I'm, I'm not trying to be critical of them, but can you confirm this? With, can you confirm that under EPA's projections for West Virginia and Virginia, there will be zero counties in 2025 that will exceed 65 or 70 parts per billion? Does that sound right to you? That does sound right to me. And w okay, let, I have a minute and a little over a minute. Let me just get to some other questions about health and science-based standards. The Clean Air Act requires EPA to review the science behind the national ambient air quality standards for every five years to ensure the best information is used. EPA examined thousands of scientific studies when reviewing the ozone standard. And given this body of evidence, what are some of the health impacts associated with breathing air that contains ozone? And what groups of people are most at risk from breathing air containing ozone? So ozone can have a range of uh, impacts on the respiratory system, um, inflammation of the lungs, exacerbated um, asthma. Um, uh, and this is especially significant for people who have asthma, for children, for the elderly, for people with compromised respiratory systems. Uh, the studies also show an association between premature mortality um, and exposure to ozone. So I understand that the Clean Air Scientific Advisory Committee and EPA scientists recommended that the agency strengthen the ozone standard from 75 parts per billion to a level within the range of 60 to 70. So the administrator has proposed to strengthen the standard to a level within the range of 65 to 70. Is the proposed ozone level an aggressive or overzealous action by EPA, as some may claim? Uh, we believe that the, the range that the administrator proposed is very well supported by the scientific information and, and affirmed, as you just noted, by our external peer review uh, panel. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This time I recognize the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Long, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. McCabe, at the same time the EPA is moving forward with its proposed, or excuse me, uh, with its proposed ozone rule, it's also proposing its clean power plan, which would require states to prepare plans to submit to the EPA. How can we realistically expect the EPA to manage several new rounds of state plan revisions that will be needed with the new ozone standard at the same time that they're reviewing plans for the clean power plan? Well, That's going to take a lot of money and a lot of people, isn't it? And do you have those people and that money? Uh, these are important programs that the Clean Air Act directs us to, to implement. Um, so we expect to, um, to use our resources to work with the states uh, to, to, uh, to get this work done. You expect to, but is it, is it practical? Is it feasible? I mean, a lot of people want to do a lot of things, uh, have lofty goals, but when push comes to shove, they can't get it done. Do you realistically think that this is something that the agency can handle? 
I do, Congressman. This is this is our job to do, and we'll make sure that we get it done. Okay, I know I know it's your job, but I just question how it can possibly how you can have the resources, the t the time. You're behind on several things already: the time, the money, and the uh, employees to to accomplish the well, goal. So, some of this work is is overlapping as well. Some of the technical work that we do in terms of uh, air quality modeling. Um, and it's, it, it, it's efficient um, to, to do some of these things together. Um, uh, so some of the state plan revisions overlap? The, the technical work that underlies uh, the, the work that, that EPA and the states uh, need to do in order to implement these programs. Okay. Uh, a few months ago, I met with uh, some city officials from Springfield, Missouri, which is my hometown. I represent Springfield, Branson, Missouri, Joplin, Missouri, Southwest Park of Missouri, and they are one of the most forward-thinking cities and have done more work on an integrated plan than about anyone. In fact, they were invited out to, I believe it was Alexandria, and uh, just them and one other city, I think some, can't remember now the other city, but there's only two cities in the United States were invited out to uh, present how they did their plan and what they do, but anyway, <clears throat> They uh, discussed this uh, integrated plan for implementing mandates from the Environmental Protection Agency, and after analyzing the cost of the mandates over the next 20 years, and I've heard some people speculate that here today that uh, things are never as bad as they seem, but if this was even 50 percent accurate, it's, it's not doable. It's devastating, and uh, they found that complying with the EPA mandates would cost each individual in my district, each of my 751,000 constituents, $46,000. Now, you can cut that in half if you'd like and say 23, but anyway, and cut it in half again if you'd like, but it, it's, it's not feasible. It's not doable. Missouri alone is looking at billions of dollars in compliance costs with a proposed ozone regulation and financial impact that it'll have on everything from manufacturing to transportation and it's gonna like I say affect have an impact on each one of my constituents do you all look at the comprehensive financial and economic Im impact to these regulations at all that they're gonna have on the states and our constituents well I'm not familiar with exactly the study that you're talking about congressman so I, I will speak get to it that, to you I will integrated plan the city of Springfield uh, for the next 20 years, I will be glad to provide that to you and your staff. But let's say that you were familiar with it. What, at what point, my question is, do you all look at the economic impact? We, 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 so each rule um, uh, looks at, the, at its impacts in light of uh, the rules that have come before it. Um, and so, so there is a, um, an understanding of the, um, of the, of the rules and the, and the impacts, both benefits and costs, um, that, that are associated but with But there the is a weight programs. given to cost? I'm sorry? There is a weight, there is a consideration given to the cost? Whenever we do regulations, there's an evaluation of cost and of benefits. Okay. Uh, I guess that that's uh, I'm about out of time anyway, and uh, Morgan stole some of my notes, I think, and asked some of my questions. So anyway, with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. This time, the chair recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Flores. For well, thank you, Mr. Biden. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Trader McCabe, thank you for joining us today. If you, um, how does the market price risk? I mean, if you, if you know something and you, you know what the cost is of something, it has a price, and you know that price. But if you don't know something, then the price is higher because you have risk, right? Um, I, yes. I, okay. In 2010, the EPA, uh, when they proposed going to 60 parts per billion, said that that would cost $90 billion, cost the economy $90 billion. In 2014, you reduced it to $40, million, $40 billion. What happened over that, that four-year period to make the cost go down? So I think what you're comparing is the uh, the proposal that was put out under the ozone reconsideration um, compared with... Yeah, just the, tell me what made it go down. One. Yeah. Um, so in that first one, um, we were looking at uh, a change of the standard from the, pr the previous standard of 85 parts per billion 
uh, to that level of in the range of 60 to and so you weren't this is not a uh, 75 to 60 that's right uh, okay that all was, right that was a reconsideration of the prior standard uh, okay thank you and then the um, in in your proposal to go to either 70 or 65 a significant amount of the control technology is doesn't exist today and that's where the risk question comes in so do you know what it costs to, to offset a ton of ozone in the Galveston Houston area today um, I, I it's about hundred and seventy thousand dollars a ton so where did the EPA price its unknown risk technology on a per ton of avoided ozone? So we, we looked across the... Just give me a number. Um, oh, oh the, the number? Yeah, just give me um, a number. Um, I believe it was... About $15,000. That's what I was going to say. Yeah, $15,000. So if we know in Texas what the cost to offset a ton of ozone is, and it's $170,000... Where did we come up with $15,000 for imaginary technology that doesn't exist? Where in the world did that come from? By looking at the, the, the history of the costs of pollution control technology over the years, and this is actually a, a, a conservative estimate based on the actual cost to control pollution that we've is seen. Is that a publicly time. available document? To uh, look at? All, of, all of our assumptions okay. are publicly available. Well, let me say that it doesn't pass the smell test. When we know today what the cost is for an offset, and then and you have imaginary technology that does not exist, and we, we just price it at a fire sale to give it a Walmart price, that's, that's crazy. Um, the, let's, let's talk about background ozone for a minute. Here's a map, a background ozone map. Uh, Texas has about 70 parts per billion on average, 72 parts per billion of background ozone. So if you take the level to 65, what's Texas supposed to do? Get a big vacuum and send it down to the ozone hole in Antarctica or what? Well, I'm, I'm not familiar with that map, but that number doesn't sound right to me. Constantly. Well, that's right. We can, okay. We, we, Let's use something a little bit more discreet. How about uh, Rocky Mountain National Park has a background of 77. Mm -hmm. There's no industry in Rocky Mountain National Park. As I mentioned, there, particularly in that part of the country, there are a few areas where we're seeing high background. So what do you do? You said you had to have a national standard a minute ago. So how are you going to clean up Rocky Mountain National Park and take it 65? Well, it, it is not responsible for cleaning up air pollution that it doesn't create, and the Clean Air Act provides mechanisms to make sure that... So what's the mechanism? Well, how do you clean up Na Rocky Mountain National Park? Um, you, you, to the extent that, that pollution is coming from places that we can control... Yeah. Um, that, well, in this case, it's not. Well, in, in, in 77 parts per billion, background means, by definition, it's not being produced there. It's coming from somewhere else. Right. So, uh, so naturally occurring causes so or if it, China. If it's, if it's coming from a motor vehicle uh, it's around the country that, that, uh, where that air pollution is, is uh, coming into that area, our rules will help reduce that. If it's Let's talk about RFS for a minute. Under your 2010 regulatory impact analysis of the renewable fuel standard, the EPA concluded that the program would contribute to ozone as a consequence of increased ethanol use. Disregarding that altogether, EPA recently proposed that its latest targets for RFS through 2016 will lead to higher levels of ethanol. And according to the, uh, to, to the studies of the Journal of Geophysical Research, that measured ozone's, uh, emissions of ozone forming uh, VOCs from ethanol refineries, it's five times higher than, than uh, the EPA's original estimate. So the EPA, on one hand, is saying, okay, you've got to reduce to, 60 to uh, uh, 65 to 70 parts per billion. On the other hand, you're trying to cram more ethanol in the system, which has a five times worse uh, ozone impact on the economy than does the production of regular gasoline. I'll submit the rest of my questions in writing. Thank you. I yield back. Jim yields back. At this time, I recognize the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Hudson, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Administrator, for being here today. Um, I represent rural North Carolina. I grew up with love for the outdoors, and I certainly understand our, uh, the importance of protecting the environment. But like many of my colleagues, I, I do have concerns about this proposed rule, and, and I thought it was fascinating my, my colleague from Florida, Ms. Castor said that the air in Tampa, Florida is clean, that it used to be polluted, but now it's clean. But I looked up Hillsborough County, Florida, and the ozone levels are 71. So even by her definition, it's clean. I, I believe her. Uh, but even Tampa, Florida would be out of, out of attainment. And, 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 and what I really want to talk about is one of my counties, uh, Montgomery County, North Carolina. Uh, it's a very rural county. A majority of the county is part of Uwari National Forest. 
this county has been decimated with job loss. We've lost manufacturing jobs. Uh, there is no major significant industry in the county, uh, yet um, this county has 66 parts per billion uh, in ozone, so it would be out of attainment if the, if the standard were 65. And, and again, this is a beautiful county. It's got two rivers, it's got a lake. The air quality is wonderful. It's, it's a rural, beautiful community. Um, what, what, what would the EPA do with a, with a county in a situation like that? Well, I think we need to be careful about making assumptions about which counties will, will be and won't be non-attainment because we don't know that. Um, we don't know what a final standard will be uh, if a decision is made to revise it. But also those decisions will be made based on uh, future air quality data. They will, they will be uh, the, the numbers that I believe you're citing are based on air quality data from 2011 through 2013. Uh, we will use current m most recent air quality data when we make those decisions and air quality is trending in a good direction. Um, so uh, I, I, I think we need to not assume uh, an area um, will be will or won't be non-attainment based on uh, information that's from, from prior years. So do you that's, think the level would stay above 70? Uh, which, which level? The, the, the EPA sets for air quality? No, I'm not, I'm not speaking to what decision might be finally made. I'm speaking to the information that people are citing ab about whether areas based on air quality now will be in attainment if there is a revision to the standard, and we just, we just don't know that. Uh, that being said, we've, we've talked, and I, I, I understand the comments that, that many of the members have made about being concerned about rural um, areas, and we do have the ability to, 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 to work with those areas. The Clean Air Act does recognize um, th that there are areas that, that don't control their air quality, and they don't, uh, the Clean Air Act doesn't hold those areas responsible for uh, reducing pollution if, if it's not being produced there. Well, I appreciate that, and, and obviously a county like Montgomery County desperately needs jobs, and if, if we get to a non-attainment situation where we can't hire new people, we can't attract new industry, it's devastating. Um, so what specifically would Montgomery County, North Carolina do if hypothetically it were in non-attainment? Uh, do, do we you know, file a lawsuit against uh, a local city or I mean, how do you? Well, pro do programs like the, the, the motor vehicle standards will improve air quality everywhere in the country where, where motor vehicles are used. Um, this is an example of how uh, the federal state partnership works where, where federal programs bring cleaner air all across the country um, and will take care of the air pollution in many areas where, um, where there's not a lot of local industry that it is, is contributing. So we'd have to give up our pickup trucks in suburbans? No, no, is that no. no, no. The, 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 as the fleet turns over, as people um, uh, buy newer cars, the fuels are getting cleaner, and, and, and so air quality will improve. What, what percentage do you think uh, motor vehicles contribute to that? Uh, well, motor vehicles generally uh, contribute about a third of the air pollution in the country. And, and see, it's not just cars driven in Montgomery County. It's cars driven um, in the region that are contributing to uh, regional uh, air pollution. Well, I appreciate that. And, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, I have three resolutions I'd like to insert in the record. Um, one is from Cabarrus Regional Chamber of Commerce. Another is from Rowan County Board of Commissioners. And a third is from the Cabarrus Rowan Urban Area Metropolitan Planning Organization. All these organizations oppose this new standard, and I seek unanimous consent to have them served in the record at this time. Without objections, so order. Well, thank you, and um, I, you know I would I would just, again thank you for your testimony. Um, but I just have concerns that uh, we are setting standards so low that they're not attainable, and when rural areas uh, that aren't near industrial areas or not near big cities uh, can't reach the attainment. A significant portion, 10 of the 12 rural counties in my district. Uh, I think this, we may be we may be using the wrong metric. So uh, that's my concern. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. This time, I recognize the gentleman lady from uh, North Carolina, Ms. Elmer, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and um, thank you, Ms. McCabe, for being with us today. You know, I just want to start off, as my colleague from North Carolina was pointing out, um, basically the concerns that we have in North Carolina. You know, just in our home state alone, this rule will kill over 13,000 jobs a year and decrease the state's GDP dr drastically at a time when we can afford it the least. This proposal raises serious concerns, and I look forward to this discussion. Uh, I definitely have some questions for you. Starting off with, um, in September of 2011, President Obama requested that your agency withdraw its proposed ozone standard based on his, quote, 
concerns about the importance of reducing regulatory burdens and regulatory uncertainty, particularly as our economy continues to recover, end quote. Your agency agreed to withdraw the proposed standard, and now you're issuing the re re revised standard. Can you tell us what changes you made to decrease the regulatory burden, which now allows you to move forward? Uh, well, uh, first let me explain that uh, at, at that time the, the, um, the agency was engaged in a reconsideration of the 2008 ozone standard, um, which was not a mandatory duty. Uh, we're under a mandatory duty to relook at the standard every five years. It was last reviewed in 2008, so this is our required review. So there are less, th there are less regulations now? This, this is about science. This particular decision is about science and public health and what the science says about what is healthy in the air to breathe. Implement but but ma'am, uh, just, just to in, not to interrupt you, but to point out that the president said that he was asking for you to decrease the amount of regulations. What regulations have you decreased which can move us forward? I understand you're looking at the science. I'm a nurse. I understand science. But what, what is it that you have done to make this process move forward so that we can all come together and work on it? Well, we have uh, put out regulations like the, the, the Tier 3 uh, regulation that I mentioned a minute ago, uh, which will bring improved air quality all across the country. That's, that's um, uh, things that states won't have to do them. Is that less cumbersome than what existed in 2008? It is a provision that will help uh, states and municipalities meet the ozone standard. Okay. Moving on, um, you know, the first question that any economic developer asks when, when locating new plants or considering expansion of an existing plant is the attainment status. And I know um, uh, my colleague from North Carolina, we were having this conversation just a moment ago. Areas designated as non-attainment are immediately excluded from consideration. The Clean Air Act requires that the Clean Air Scientific Advisory Committee to advise the administrator of any adverse public health, welfare, social, economic, or energy effects which may result from various strategies for attainment and main maintenance of such national ambient air quality standards. Given the adverse economic impact of a revised standard, why are you not requiring KSAC to take all of these things into consideration in regard to economic development? Um, uh, in, in setting the health standard, we've been specifically uh, directed by the Supreme Court that uh, looking at the implementation implications is not part of setting the health standard. And so in So the th Supreme in this Court told you that economic development is not significant and should not be considered. It's not relevant to the setting of the public health standard. Okay, moving on. Um, Non-attainment designation indiscriminately reduces development, including development associated with military bases. This is particularly important for North Carolina as we have many strong military presence there. Um, the standard of the level at the near natural background as is currently being considered will potentially limit military expansion and place at risk our military readiness. How is your agency planning on, on ensuring that your revised ozone standard will not jeopardize national security? Uh, Congressman, I'm, I'm not aware of, of, of any instance in which the ozone standard has uh, interfered with our military uh, readiness. Well, then I would love to work with your office because my understanding is there are some, some situations, especially affecting some of our North Carolina bases now, that, that this, will, this will dramatically affect. So um, we'll, I, I we'll, would like to continue that conversation. We'll be glad to follow up. Great. Um, now, lastly, and I've got 31 seconds, um, you know, part of, of this continued problem is how are manufacturers going to be able to deal with this technology. If, if a manufacturer simply cannot meet these standards, what, what are their options? Are, are, are they to, to buy expensive offsets? Are they to close their doors? What, what, what do we do? How do we help our manufacturers? Um, we, we, we work with the states and, and with the business industry. We look at the, 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 where the pollution is coming from, and, and we um, uh, develop uh, programs that are targeted towards uh, addressing the most cost-effective reductions. Um, and that's what we have done through the whole history of, of the Clean Air Act, uh, where manufacturing um, has, has moved forward, has Im implemented new technologies, uh, has been able to grow. Do existing controls exist right now to achieve the 60 parts per billion standard or the 65 parts per billion standard? Well, keep in mind the administrator did not propose a 60 part per billion standard. Um, when we looked at the range of 65 to 70, which is what she proposed, mm -hmm. um, we uh, uh, identified a number of 
already existing controls um, that will get What are those existing controls? Um, uh, th things like um, uh, cleaner engines, um, scrubbers, uh, uh, NOx controls, um, uh, uh, lower VOC um, paints and coatings, a variety of technologies uh, that ha have been developed over the years that, that many areas are not yet employing that, that, that could be employed. Thank you. I yield back. The gentlelady's time has expired. At this time, I recognize the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Johnson, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ms. McCabe. Thanks um, for joining us again today. Uh, you know, increased access to low-cost, sustainable domestic natural gas production has helped tremendously uh, in fueling the manufacturing renaissance in this country. Uh, this expansion has resulted not only in cleaner gas, and electricity for manufacturers, but also provides a new source of natural gas liquids, which are essential feedstocks in many major manufacturing applications, such as chemicals and plastics. A study conducted uh, by the consulting firm NERA, frequently contracted by the Department of Energy, among others, shows dramatic cost increases in the price of natural gas under a 60 parts per billion standard. The study projects a 52 percent increase in the cost of natural gas for industrial use under a 60 part per billion standard. So uh, quick question, can we expect our manufacturing renaissance to continue under this type of scenario? Yeah, I, I can't speak to that study specifically, but I know that and there certainly has been a, a significant increase in the development of, uh, of natural gas. It's a very important... Uh, well, we know that, but what I'm asking you is when, when, when we're essentially taxing it uh, with these standards, uh, and I might, uh, I might point out to you that in a recent trip that we made to Europe, uh, ratepayers, businesses and residential ratepayers in Europe um, are, are taking a, a strong second look at their energy profiles because of this exact problem, making their businesses non-competitive and their unwillingness to pay the exorbitant high prices for energy that's going to result from a rule like this. So how can we expect the manufacturing renaissance to continue when we're taxing essentially uh, the very energy that's, that's providing that, uh, that renaissance? Well, I don't, I don't think we are taxing the, the energy. Well, sure you are. Uh, if you get a 52 percent increase in the cost of natural gas under a 62 parts per billion standard, that's, that's, a, that's essentially a tax. Well, I'm, you can I'm, call it whatever you want to, but it's a tax on the industry. Well, I'm, I'm not sure that I agree with those Okay, well, we'll agree to fighting. disagree. Let me move on. Uh, let me focus on how the EPA has calculated the benefits of its proposed ozone standard. And here's the issue in a nutshell. Instead of calculating only the benefits from reducing nitrogen oxides and volatile organic compounds, the constituents of ozone, which are emitted from cars, trucks, and stationary sources, EPA also incorporated the co-benefits from reducing particulate matter, or PM, from those same sources. Of course, this rulemaking has nothing to do with particulate matter. EPA has a separate national ambient air quality standard for particulate matter, not to mention multiple other rules to regulate it under the Clean Air Act. But without the benefits from PM reductions, the ozone rule uh, would have very little to show for it. In fact, Dr. Ann Smith of NERA uh, has pointed out that these PM co-benefits are actually larger than the direct ozone-related benefits from the rule. If you don't accept NERA's assessment, then how about Cass Sunstein, the former head of OMB's Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs? He reviewed the ozone reconsideration in 2011 and helped prevent that proposal from being finalized because it was too costly. Here's what he said about this, and I quote, but on some of the agency's estimates of the 2011 ozone proposal, the net benefits would have been zero. Moreover, a strong majority of the benefits would have resulted not from ozone reductions, but from co-benefit reductions in particulate matter, which come as an incidental benefit of the technologies that reduce ozone emissions. So, Ms. McCabe, this prompts a number of questions. First, can you explain to me and our committee uh, uh, the EPA's legal justification for engaging in this kind of double counting? How is it that you can justify a lower ozone standard using benefits from an entirely different pollutant? 
Well, it's not double. That's not science. It's you know, that's that's a shell game. That's what that is. That's not science. It's not double counting. Those benefits are real. Those those but that's not what you're, that's not what this rule. This rule is supposed to be going after ozone, not particulate matter. But it is having additional benefits to the. But very little public in terms of the ozone. Very little in terms of the ozone in comparison with the benefits that are coming from uh, particulate matter. Further. Uh, talk to me about how transparent you've been with this uh, to the American public. I mean, there are charts buried in the proposed rule where somebody, somebody maybe with a Ph.D. can go infer this information about double counting. But have you or the administrator explained this issue in your speeches and public statements about the ozone? Have you told the American people that the benefits are coming from somewhere else, from a pollutant that is already well regulated? by the EPA? We're, we're very clear, and, and I, I myself personally have talked about co-benefits that are achieved by, by programs that we implement. Yeah, well, I think it's a shell game, Ms. McCabe, and I think it's economically destructive to the region of my country, uh, the, the, my region of the country, and to other industries that are providing the jobs and the economic vitality of America today. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Chairman yields back. Uh, I, I have a couple of other questions I want to ask of Mr. Rush, and then I want to ask you a couple of other questions, Ms. McCabe. The Science Advisory Committee is appointed by who? Um, the Science Advisory uh, Committee is, um, uh, there's an office within EPA that uh, administers um, uh, the, the Science Advisory Board and has a, a very um, open process for. But the people who serve on the Science Advisory Committee, mm -hmm. how are they selected? Um, they, they are nominated. Um, and by who? Um, either um, by themselves or by others, and uh, that's through a public process. And then who makes the decision of who serves? Um, that's, that's a decision made uh, within the agency by our Office of the Science. So EPA decides who serves on the Science Committee? Uh, th through, a, through a robust public okay. process. And how long do they serve? Uh, I don't know the answer to that. Jim. And how many people serve on that committee? Uh, it, I, I, I don't know the answer to that. The, the Could you get us a list of the names sure. of people on the committee and sure. how long their term of office is? Yes. Yes. Okay. I, I believe it's, you know, it's on the order of four to six years okay. or something like that. Thank you. Uh, Ms. McCabe, how long has that committee been in, in existence? How long has? How long has it been in existence? The, the agency? Yeah, no, the committee, the science. Science Committee. Uh, gosh, I, I, I don't know, um, Congressman Rush, but we can certainly find out many, many years, many years. To both Republican and Democratic administration? Oh, ab yes, ab absolutely. And, the, and the, the, the committees and the panels are, 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 are very well balanced to make sure that there's a range of, uh, of views represented. Oh, is it, would you say that is bipartisan? Yes, I would. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have one more question. <clears throat> Ms. McKay, we, we keep hearing about the President's decision in 2010 on the ozone standard. Uh, and let me read from, from that. With that in mind, this is what I want to read. <clears throat> statement by the President. Uh, work is already underway to update a 2006 review of the science that will result in the reconsideration of the ozone standard in 2013. Ultimately, and this is, comes directly from the President uh, on the ozone national ambient air quality standards issued on September the 2nd, 2011. Ultimately, I did not support asking state and local governments to begin implementing a new standard that will soon be reconsidered. Uh, do you have any comments? Is that yeah, do you remember the, the, those uh, that statement by the president? Yeah, yeah. So the president was recognizing that the regular five-year re review of the ozone standard was already underway, mm -hmm. um, and that's what he was directing the agency to focus its, its attention on. 
Um, I, I should, if I could just clarify something I said before, uh, Congressman Resch, I, yeah. I agreed with your characterization of the Science Advisory Board as bipartisan. I think it's probably more accurate to call it nonpartisan. It's nonpartisan. Like, you know, the, the okay. All right. Well, thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I don't have any additional questions, but I do I have a unanimous uh, consent request to enter into the record a letter from the public health organization opposing legislation or amendments that would block or delay EPA's work to update uh, ozone standards. Also, a letter from the National Association of Clean Air Agencies supporting the EPA's proposal to revise the current ozone air standard. And I ask for unanimous consent that they be entered into the record. Without objection, so ordered. Uh, that I yield back the balance of my time. And then I would also like to ask unanimous consent that the following documents be entered into the record. Number one, a survey released by the Association of Air Pollution Control Agencies entitled State Environmental Agency Perspectives on background ozone and regulatory relief. Number two, a June 2015 article from the Journal of Science entitled Challenges of a Lowered U.S. Ozone Standard. And number three, comments of a Texas, one of, one of the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality on EPA's proposed ozone rule, a Texas commissioner's comments. Without objection, uh, that will be entered to the record as well. And that concludes uh, today's hearing. Once again, Ms. McCabe, thank you for being with us. We look forward to continuing engagement with you as we move forward. And we'll keep the record open for 10 days for any additional questions or comments or materials. And with that, uh, the hearing is now adjourned. <laughs>